I think we figured. I think we figured it out. Um, can everyone see us now? They're streaming. Yes. Okay. Cool. I, th I think. Okay. Cool. Cool. Sorry about that, everyone. We had some some technical difficulties. <laughs> um, luckily, I'm not the one building out the blockchain. So. Um, okay. So welcome everyone to Solana season event. Uh, we'll do a super short intro and kind of just jump right into it. This is going to be an intro to the Solana programming model. We have Bartos, who is one of the core engineers at Solana today, who's just going to walk you all through A to Z, everything you need to know. Um, starting next week, we're going to be doing open office hours as well. So we'll be posting those to the Solana season website. And we're going to be doing those over Twitch, hopefully with no technical difficulties, where we'll set an hour aside and you'll have a chance to just ask questions directly to one of the core developers. So I think with that, Bartos, you just want to want to take it over? Sure. Um, so let's start the screen share, I guess. And first, I figured I would just like talk to people about like uh, how you can actually like get started uh, just because it's intro and the hackathon is like starting only like like actually in like two days. Um, so first you just go here, install Solana CLI. The, the cool thing about uh, Solana development uh, environment is we try to keep everything uh, fairly straightforward in terms of like everything is just like plain Rust, which is one of the main languages for people to use uh, during the development of the programs. Uh, this is how we are calling smart contracts on Solana for people that are coming from other platforms. Um, and you can do everything for CLI, uh, either Cargo or Solana. You just go here, install that, configure your Rust environment. This all describes everything fairly well. I will like keep posting when I keep talking on the chat. Um, so you can go to this like install CLI and go from there. Um, the next thing that I wanted to kind of like start talking about is uh, in the developing section on like uh, how how programs and how you interact with the blockchain are really structured on Solana. So on the high level, everything on Solana is an account, uh, which is really a like important concept to understand. Uh, and I, when I talk with people, it's one of the ones that's kind of like tricky at the beginning because everything is an account. You're uh, program itself is starting an account, your native uh, soul as token is starting an account, but also your data is stored on an account. Um, the helpful uh, analogy that I like to use here is uh, all the accounts in Solana, you can think of them as files. Uh, they have certain limitations. So for example, the size of the account, uh, the maximum is like 10 megabytes. Uh, and if you want to store data in the account, you need to pay for it. Uh, we have this concept of rent. Uh, we use a Sol native token uh, to top the account to effectively pay for rent. If you preload two years worth of rent uh, into an account, the account is then considered rent free and you don't really need to pay for it. Um, then on the high level, when you want to interact with the blockchain itself, you go through our like RPC nodes and send uh, transactions. It's just simple JSON RPC uh, that's available through uh, either Rust API or JavaScript API that you can call. Uh, there is a bunch of community libraries that you can use. Uh, I know someone built a cool Java library that uh, you can interact with the RPC nodes as well. Uh, there's Python as well, uh, and tons of resources in general, how to actually execute transactions on Solana. Then individual transactions are broken into instructions. Uh, and this is, uh, you can think of it as function calls to your program. Um, so the other thing that's important to understand about smart contracts on Solana or programs is they don't really hold any state. Uh, and that's really an important feature because it allows us to enable, uh, for example, upgradable smart contracts out of the box without any special patterns on top of it. Um, so what happens is let's take an example, the token program uh, from Solana program library, which we are calling for short SPL. Uh, that represents uh, a token that you can deploy yourself. Uh, you can actually do it from, uh, from command line. You can create new token uh, with a mint uh, and it doesn't require any Rust knowledge. You can just do it straight from the command line or from the JavaScript, your website, uh, which I think is super cool. 
but it's only possible because you don't need to deploy actually a new program with Rust on the chain. Uh, but what it implies is you are really reusing the shared code that's deployed in the token program itself. Uh, you can see it on Explorer. So our Explorer is at solana.com. So you can go here. Uh, if you search for token, that will let you find the token program. Um, and that shows you that like how big is the token program that was uploaded by the loader and what's the address of the token program itself. And you can as well see all the instructions that are being executed. So if I click on one of the transactions, you can see what's happening in the transactions itself, what, what how people are minting the tokens and what's happening. So for example, this instruction was not recognized. Someone probably created their custom program uh, and executed a mint instruction with single token. And because Solana programs don't store any state, uh, that implies that you need to pass all the state to it uh, in similar way that you would pass state to the uh, pure function. So at the beginning, when you look at the Explorer, it actually lists all the instructions here with the post balances that change as well with the tokens. So the tokens are kind of separate from the sol balances. So you can think of it some of those balances here don't change because those are just rent balances on the Explorer. Um, so once you once you move past like understanding the basic, like everything is an account uh, and you want to actually build something, the other useful concept to understand is uh, program derived accounts. Uh, and it's a special type of account that doesn't have a private key and it doesn't need to uh, like it cannot like be it cannot sign messages from the outside. The only way to sign uh, transactions for the program derived accounts is from the program that really owns that account. And it's really useful to tracking the state uh, of uh, the programs that you are building. Uh, and it's uh, I think one of the hardest concepts to understand at the beginning, like what's the difference really between the program accounts and program derived uh, addresses. Uh, that prog uh, like programs itself own. Uh, but once you understand it, it like allows you to create uh, effectively predictable uh, account addresses that can be discovered from outside of the blockchain um, to, to look up information that you are looking for and then interact easily with the smart contracts. And I think this is all described here in terms of like you when you are executing transactions, you need to uh, think who is who is signing the specific account, who can change it, uh, and is the account like for example executable. Um, the other thing that's uh, once you are building uh, smart contracts when you are executing it, you cannot actually create new accounts on the fly um, from the smart contract itself. What what's required is uh, you need to uh, allocate a new address uh, before calling the, the function and then maybe you can allocate the space or you can allocate it before with uh, create account instruction and funding it with, uh, uh, with Sol. So maybe from there, the, the good place to, to look at existing Rust account programs that we created is Solana program library repository. It contains reference implementations. Um, for a bunch of programs that we created, including the token program itself. So you could potentially take it and modify it, but you could also, um, you could just use it, like I said before, if you don't want to customize it. There is an AMM implementation, there is borrow lending platform that supports uh, liquidations and multiple markets with cross collateral. Uh, and there's like other utility programs like memo program, for example, that allows you to add like memo to a transaction. Um, so this is usually, if you're a Rust developer, this is the repository that you want to really start looking at and uh, figuring out how, how to build a smart contract on Solana. Uh, if you are starting from the JavaScript side on the other side, um, I created for people that are doing this hackathon, this dApp scaffold, um, that allows you quickly bootstrap your, um, your project with a React application and a simple like unopinionated hello world example in Rust. Um, the other thing to remember, at least with the smart contracts on Solana, we don't force anyone into specific serialization layer uh, and like communication layer between your application and, 
and the application itself. So what, what happens then is um, you need to pick what you want to like use. You could use Google protocol buffers, you could use Borsch, uh, you could use just like serialization provided by Rust. There is a lot of people that started using Ancor, uh, built by people from Serum. It's a great library. I recommend you try it. Uh, it's available here on the cover. It simplifies really the interaction um, with the uh, with the smart contracts because it generates uh, the uh, communication layer between your application and the smart contract and simplifies a bunch of boilerplates uh, that you will see sometimes in Solana program library because uh, at the time when we were building it. Uh, Anchor didn't exist, but also we wanted to keep the list of dependencies fairly small. Uh, and that was also the uh, guiding principle in this React app. Like, is it is it a like production ready application that I would deploy? Probably not, uh, just because it doesn't have like a state management library. It doesn't have like server side rendering. It's like just like simplest client side uh, React like React application created with uh, Create React app uh, that you can pull and start running. And this, this also walks you through how you set up your full environment and how you can start interacting with both the, the hooks that are created here, um, as well as a sample client for the, for the program that you can build. Um, for Solana program library, we also have the extensive documentation here. So if you want to uh, read about like, how do you interact with tokens? How do you, how do you create your own token again? You don't need to know Rust. You can start reading just this documentation and this covers like, how do you create your own fungible token? And you literally just like pull this command line uh, from here, SPL token, create token, and you have new token. Uh, as a developer, uh, that's fairly simple, but also for people that are not developers, this makes it super straightforward to actually uh, interact with the tokens and see it's actually easy to use. You can then interact with the, uh, with the entities that you created on the blockchain. So the accounts that are created uh, from the token program is actually, um, you have two types of accounts that are created uh, by the token program. One is the mint and the other one is the token account. Um, and this is a good example for people to first understand that one program can create multiple types of accounts that that program understands. Uh, and they can have a different cardinality if you're coming from like a database world where the mint really is created once for a given token, it tracks the supply of that token uh, and who has the rights to mint it or freeze that mint. Uh, and then the token accounts are held by individual token holders to track effectively who owns different tokens. Hey, hey Bartos, um, um, do, you wanna, you can, do you wanna increase yeah. your, your font size just a little bit? I adjusted the sure. screen. Um, I think that might be perfect. If that's better, everyone let us know sure. in the, the chat, please. Sorry, guys. I always have the same problem. Uh, one, one. More. <laughs> Thank you. One more. more. Two more. Okay. Boom. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So th this allows you to again describes fungible tokens and non fungible tokens as well. So the interesting aspect is the the standard for both fungible and non fungible tokens on Solana is actually the same. The only difference between fungible token and non-fungible one is you set decimals to zero, uh, you create supply of one, send it to some account and freeze that mint. Uh, so it shows you really that like once you create these programs, they, they, they can be highly reusable. Uh, and it brings me to the other concept that uh, with token program itself is super interesting. Uh, maybe not so for people that are coming from other blockchains, but if you are coming from outside of the blockchain development world, like tokenization. So when you think about tokenization through the token program, um, it actually allows you to not only track the like list of tokens that people have, but I often think of it as the way to track ownership rights of something. Uh, and then the API for other uh, programs to interact with uh, between themselves, which is, uh, which is very powerful concept because um, it allows you to use this very known well entity that's supported by the wallets to display to the user that they actually own something. Uh, even though it might not have the value or it's like not, not necessarily tradable immediately on some market uh, and has a very limited supply. And this is where like 
normally non fungible tokens people associate them with just uh, like art that you can read in like newspapers uh, but it's a super powerful concept to uh, indicate to the user that they own something they can see it in the wallet and it could be anything uh, you could create a like non fungible token that represents for example your your car uh, and then uh, or from the smart contract layer you could think of like for example options if you're creating options you could uh, you could imagine that specific strike creates a token that can be then traded freely, but um, but it's not necessarily exchangeable for option with a different strike on the same instrument. So it becomes like its own entity and allows them programs like, for example, Serum Dex that's available uh, here. Let me just send the link there uh, to the again Rust program. Um, so this is a central limit board order book provided by, by Serum and built by Serum. Uh, and if you build your programs around tokenized assets, you will immediately be able to use uh, these primitives that are available on Solana to uh, interact with other market participants. You could deploy your own central limit order book with, from literally just this like Serum UI where you go like add the market, add my token, uh, and you could start interacting with it and building on top of it. Uh, and this is one of the things that we are like super excited at Solana, where like composability between those programs and making sure that the interfaces are really straightforward for people to use um, and to interact both from the JavaScript layer, but also from the Rust layer. Um, I also wanted to touch, I guess, briefly on the, um, on the command line before I start answering questions, sorry, I kind of like don't keep the uh, uh, track of the questions right now. Uh, if you pull that repository, you can really quickly start interacting with it. From the JavaScript side, you just start like yarn, yarn start, it will start the application. Uh, and you will have it like available here. You can like, this provides a basic wallet that you can connect. So this integrates with Phantom Wallet. Uh, Phantom guys did a great job of building a Chrome extension on Solana um, that allows you to interact like in a very easy way uh, with the tokens. It's much simpler in my opinion than what you have with MetaMask, but there's a bunch of other wallets that are available um, that you can interact with. So this immediately shows you that, hey, I have some Sol available It interacted with that wallet. And I also exposed like API to give you like uh, airdrop of Sol on the DevNet uh, or testnet uh, that's often useful for development. Um, and then you just like start filling the, the gaps in this uh, specific program. Um, so I guess from there, I, I can answer a bunch of questions. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, let me, yeah, so you could, uh, yeah, I'm trying to pick like questions. There's just like, uh, I didn't keep track, so it's tricky. Uh, so the question about custom tokens and customizing the minting operation, like, yeah, sure. Technically you could do that. Uh, you could take the token program, change it, deploy your own, and it will work with, uh, with the ecosystem properly. Um, one thing to, to consider, like most people actually don't do it because like, what are you trying to achieve when you are like uh, customizing the minting process? Uh, usually you want to build like maybe some form of like vesting schedule, uh, but the reality is you don't need to do that at the minting level. You can do it at the higher level contract that owns the mint uh, through program derived address. And this is, this is what I was saying, the program derived addresses are one of the like, like most important things to understand and then tokenization because a program derived address can be an authority on the mint itself. So that mint means that the contract or smart contract and program owns then that mint uh, and can like, for example, mint more tokens with the, with the schedule. Yeah, you could really easily build a, a program on Solana that mimics the uh, like release schedule of like uh, any other like crypto asset. Um, sure. So more in terms of like explaining PDAs. So the, the 
again, like I said, program derived addresses uh, at the beginning, hard to understand at the very high level, they are just uh, accounts that uh, program owns. Like that's the very basic understanding. Uh, so if you want to create an account from your program, you could use program derived address for that. The main benefit of using program derived address versus something else is then you can actually create in a predictable way an address because the address of the program derived accounts um, is a SHA-256 uh, of multiple components that are provided to it. Uh, so you could imagine, let's say I'm creating an auction system and I want to identify each auction by the creator. I could start saying, uh, create the like auction program uh, with then hash it with the uh, like auction item that I'm trying to, to sell and uh, maybe like which consecutive sell it is. I'm kind of trying to make it on the fly. So maybe it doesn't make sense, but, and then you can send it to your program uh, and it can allocate that memory. And that, uh, that account then is discoverable by other people using that exact same combination of uh, seats, uh, seat phrases that you use to create that address. Um, and the account then also like the program itself can verify that this was created in that way. Um, it was, it's for example, used in the wormhole bridge, which is uh, the bridge between Ethereum and Solana. It supports ERC-20 right now. And there is a team that's working on support for 721 and 1155 from Ethereum. And we are, there is also a team that's working on support from like other chains. Um, but the way that wormhole bridge uses it is to create a predictable addresses for the mints that the wormhole contract owns. So let's say you have a contract on Ethereum that you want to bridge from Ethereum that has a predictable address, then the wormhole bridge takes that contract address and creates a program derived account that represents a mint with that contract address. So it's guaranteed that then there is only one mint for that one address and you can always discover if it was allocated before. All right, hopefully that answered the question. Um, yeah, so like, SPL token address, sure, it, it can be any account that is not allocated yet. So if you create a new account, that's fine. Uh, you can like you can use Solana Keygen to generate a key uh, and allocate that account as well to have like a nice name uh, if you want to grind it or it can be program derived address. Uh, the only requirement really is that you are able to actually sign the message that creates that account and and that's it. All right, so in terms of contract execution, yes, Solana charges for executing transactions. Uh, the, the way it's calculated right now is it takes number of signers uh, and just uh, uses a flat fee for all the, like, for the given transaction. So what that means is uh, we give you a, a maximum limit of the operations that you can execute within instruction. Right now it's 200,000 operations per instruction. Um, and we don't have rebates. So in a sense, there is a gas, but it's a, like, it's a flat calculation and we don't rebate if you don't use the limit, like, or you don't hit the limit. Um, so sure, like SPL token program, uh, like in depth guide, I like really the documentation for the token program is really extensive. You can really see how it's like working with like creating an accounts, wrapping soul, like wrapping Sol at the beginning when I was interacting with Solana smart contracts was throwing me off, for example. Um, so maybe it's worth mentioning that in order to create a wrapped Sol uh, that behaves like a SPL token, you just create an account and fund the account with rent of the amount that you want to have wrapped uh, and then initialize that account with this predefined min uh, that's specified here. And that will create a wrapped account. Uh, so it's sometimes useful if you are building uh, an interfaces that want to present to the user that they interact with the, with the salt token, but in your contract layer, you don't want to have if statements between uh, native asset and SPL token. So basically you wrap everything and just interact with the SPL interface. Um, and the way from the JavaScript library, you just execute the create an account, wrap it, and then unwrap it. And because the transactions on Solana are so cheap and we don't charge you for operations, we charge you for signers, that will not change really 
your cost uh, of the transaction. Um, so the max number of accounts that can be passed on the transaction, that's the that's a really good question. And that's one of the things that like at the beginning uh, was like tripping me. Uh, so right now, Solana transactions are limited by UDP frames. So that means you have uh, uh, like 1200 bytes um, that you can use. Uh, and that means uh, like for the whole transaction. So usually that space is really used by the account addresses. So each account address is 32 bytes. Um, and if you do like graph calculation, that means you can use around like 30 accounts for a given transaction. So not 13, but 30, three zero, like something around that. Um, in terms of the stack limit, those are like arbitrary, I guess right now limits that we think are creating a performant environment and protecting the rest of the participants on the blockchain. Uh, same with like operations. Can they be uh, technically increased? Sure. Uh, I think this would be up to the validators community to basically vote and like say, hey, we would actually want to use it. There's also a technical process that we would need to follow. We had some internal discussions uh, about increasing some of the limits, but nothing concrete right now. Um, yeah, the randomness question is, uh, is an interesting one. So right now on Solana, we don't have a VRF uh, that you can use. Um, and in order to, to fake randomness, it really depends on the situation. I think some form of commit reveal schemes are ideal. So let's say you, you have a raffle and you know you're uh, trying to select a number from zero to hundred. You could say that like you could randomize it off chain, save it in some account as a hash, and then reveal it after the game that you didn't like fake the game. And as long as the part, like you are not one of the participants and you know how to allocate it, like that should be fine. Uh, right now, that's I think the, the most simple one. Um, for the, um, so the only way around the 30 account, uh, 30 accounts max limit is to split your transactions into multiple uh, transactions. It's it's unfortunate. Sometimes it means like you need to go back to the drawing board and rethink how you are interacting with the smart contract. Um, but usually it's doable. Um, the the main it's just like uh, it's it's kind of a common restriction in a distributed systems that you will not have access to the full state and that's like we just picked this number because it like allows us to replicate the state quickly across the network. Um, but if you think in terms of uh, like PDA, PDAs often will actually help you uh, prevent sending so many accounts that you need to iterate over because they allow you to pinpoint exactly the account that you need uh, for a given instruction. So if you are finding yourself hitting like transaction size limit, uh, try using like PDAs. Uh, uh, the other thing that is useful with PDAs that you can uh, find in the scaffold project is uh, you will be able to discover the accounts using the RPC calls uh, when you query get program accounts. So if you go to like accounts here, um, here. Uh, let me just come. Maybe I don't have it here, but um, one other thing that's different from some other blockchains is it's much easier to discover all the accounts that user owns. So it's kind of a similar to get program accounts, but you can get token accounts by owner, uh, pass the ID and pass the token program. So this is important. If you, if you create your own token program for whatever reason, you will need to customize this program ID. Um, if you go to this API, this has a similar thing for get program accounts. So basically you pass program ID and this allow, returns all program accounts, uh, which is often useful.
Yeah, the clock is not a good source of randomness. So right now, the like really, the, if you don't have an oracle that uh, has a distributed randomness, I think the, the easiest way really is to go some form of basic commit reveal scheme. I know it doesn't work for all the use cases, but it works for some, so maybe it will help. Um, get token accounts by owner is indexed. So it's better to use get token accounts if you need to query accounts by user. By user. Um, so the Rust example that's trying, like it, reducing the number of accounts that you need to pass, it's really a specific use case. Once you start hitting like a problem in your specific case, I would say let's cover it during like an office hours where we, you can actually walk through specific design that you have and maybe we can come up with a design that will actually work uh, that will not hit instruction limit. Um, you could look also at borrow lending platform where it splits uh, interactions with the contract where sometimes you can separate what, what part of your program uh, is permissionless and which one require permission. And sometimes that, like, like that, you will be able to reduce set of accounts that are being called. Um, so Python project code in Solana GitHub itself, no, we like Solana officially doesn't maintain the Python client, but I know there's a Python community project that uh, community maintains. Um, so in terms of no, you cannot write a contract that will then uh, somehow limit the amount of accounts that are being passed because when you are doing a, a cross program invocation, uh, you can, you can see that in the documentation as well. This is how we are calling. Um, if you go to the docs, this describes how to do calling between programs, uh, how to do how to do this. But uh, effectively, once you have the graph of calls, uh, all the accounts need to be known up front for the whole graph of calls. So it's not like you do the CPI and at that point you discover additional accounts. No, like at the top level, you need to pass all the accounts that are used throughout the graph. Uh, sure, you could like if you can like, but even if you declare the addresses uh, in your program itself, they will not be available for you to modify. So sometimes we de like declare addresses to for validation purposes, and that's something that's important from the security perspective. Um, to to check, for example, hey, is the token account that I'm modifying and actually from the token program because. You could imagine someone deployed their own token program uh, and tries to fake effectively the token account that they own that is of like totally different type. So you need to ensure that the interactions between your programs are actually owned by the programs that uh, you expect them to own. So usually this is how you would use constants for other accounts, but they still need to be passed explicitly and you just compare them with, uh, with the const that you defined in your Rust. Um, all right, let's pick some other questions. Um, sorry if I missed some. Uh, Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dan. I published that link as well. Okay, so uh, okay, so I I don't want to talk about like quantum computing right now uh, necessarily. I think this is like outside of the like intro to Solana. Um, um, in terms of the like the token list itself and how it's managed. Look, it's like we are we are not monitoring that repository right now. Like frequently, uh, you should if you are really planning to like launch a token that will get big, like plan for like like at least like a week in advance uh, or more. Uh, like it 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 will not going to stop or prevent you from actually coding anything. Um, you will be able to interact with the DEX markets and everything. Um, uh, 
Uh, sure. So the the PDA signature, the the easiest way to think about it is there is a runtime flag that basically says if the program owns that PDA, that program can set that flag. There is no private key, and then the program will uh, like sign that account, and then you call like invoke sign uh, on the on the PDAs that the program owns. Uh, yes, it's yeah. So don't answer some of the questions. Um, uh, how would you like? So I'm thinking about this. Like, how would you issue tokens for people transacting with the program? Um, so you could. Uh, not sure if I understand the question correctly, but uh, let's say if I if I if I understand correctly, so you want to have a program that basically charges for the usage, uh, and then somehow you distribute the tokens. Uh, you could have the distribution care within that program itself uh, that says, "Hey, every day we release that many tokens, and you can call a claim method on it, and you track slots using a clock." Uh, uh, the other way is you could distribute the tokens differently, like a cult community I know has a, a govern like the distributor token program that they can basically track the accounts if someone owns and then airdrop on them. So you could use that to distribute that token and then um, so you could reach out to them on Discord. Uh, but and then when you you basically subtract or burn those tokens where they hit your program, uh, I think that would be the easiest way. Uh, and you could charge a variable amount or a uh, constant amount. Um, all right, let's let's take maybe uh, like five more questions, uh, and then if you have any more specific questions, let's plan for this like office hours, just because this is kind of tricky to track all those questions. And uh... sure. So the in terms of like bugs, that's that's kind of. Uh, like security, the, the most common security issue that you have with your smart contracts is you didn't validate the inputs. If you look at uh, some of the code in Solana program library, um, let's go to maybe token swap. So if you go here to the processor, let's make this bigger. Right, so uh, the, the structure of the programs is fairly straightforward. You get this uh, iterator over the accounts. You pull all the accounts that are being passed. This is a list of the accounts uh, ordered. Um, so whenever you are calling, you need to pass all those accounts in order. Um, and then the majority of the code of your program is really like this validations. Like each instruction will have like this long validation section. Um, so often the ones that people are forgetting is like, you need to make sure that the token program that's used is the actually the token program that you expect from the uh, from the const that you want to interact with. Usually you store it in some top level object and then when people interact with tokens, you, uh, you check that. Um, you check if like the accounts that are being passed are actually owned by you uh, and like, all those validations will basically ensure that people cannot spoof the accounts. I think this is the, the most common source of errors uh, that I've seen. Um, uh, so for cross-program invocation, yes, there is a limit right now. The stack depth for cross-program invocation is four calls. Uh, for token transfers, yes, like the, the best way to think about it, there's like uh, two, like four accounts that are really interacting with each other. There's a account, token account, that token program account that stores the code, that's executing the code. There is a mint. Uh, in the transfer case, the mint is read only. And then you have two token accounts and you subtract from one and modify from the other. And uh, as long as the accounts are not overlapping, Solana then can execute multiple transactions in parallel uh, between the like multiple transfers, for example. 
And this is important consideration also when you uh, structure the data uh, for your programs, because you don't want to create this GAD object that's writable for whatever reason for all the instructions that go to your program, because that will effectively create this like uh, bottleneck for speed of execution um, or throughput. Um, the, the good example of the design is uh, the DEX market, uh, where each DEX market is kind of independent from each other and the writable accounts are really like bids and asks and the event queue. And each market has a separate uh, set of those. Uh, so then if you are trading uh, Bitcoin to USD and ETH to USD, they are totally independent from each other and can be processed in parallel. Zoom even more. Uh, no, the token I, token account balances are not tracked by PDAs. Those are just like normal accounts, but they could be. So we have this associated token program that actually creates PDAs that are then given to a user. And the idea there is to have predictable account addresses for a given wallet. Um, the way those PDAs are structured is uh, you take the wallet address, native wallet address, uh, and add the mint to it, like Serum or uh, or other tokens like COP. Uh, and that will create associated token account uh, for a given user. So that means that someone can effectively send the COP or USDC or, or Serum to that wallet, a top level wallet address without knowing uh, the specific account address. So you can actually move that, like change the ownership of the PDA and give it to someone else. Uh, for like authority that you store. So it's kind of cool. Okay, right, so. So you should, uh, so the main, the main difference is this really discoverability of the associated token accounts, uh, where you would assume that for a given wallet address, there will be only one uh, Serum or COP account and it's discoverable from outside. Uh, if you create a normal token account, which right now we kind of discourage because it, uh, it is not, it's creating basically issues for the like wallet users that they need to know the account address. Um, you would need to send to that specific account address if you wanted to do a token transfer between the two. But with associated token accounts that can be handled by like the JavaScript to just discover the account and then like send it. All right, so it looks like Dan is replying to some of that. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of getting blind to be honest. Uh, Um, okay, I, uh, okay, last question, uh, this long one. Here's an example of a use case. Um, so is it easy to monitor transactions on Serum and like reward users? So yes, I guess it depends how you want to design it. Uh, you could design it in a, so Solana doesn't have events. So you cannot like, for example, create an event in your program that says uh, on the trade executed in Serum Dex, do something with my program. Um, one way is you, I think the one that, one way that would work probably the best would be have some off-chain component that tracks the uh, changes or executions on Serum and then rewards users for, for trading. That's one. The other one is you could always modify the, the interface slightly for Serum um but that wouldn't work with the existing deployed markets um another way is like create custom ui that injects uh like a special like kind of wraps serum and injects uh special transactions there for the rewards uh but i think the the way that would work uh like the easiest right now with all the existing serum dexes if you wanted to create something like that would be some form of off-chain component that uh tracks the trades and then executes the contract uh, and acts like a crank. Okay, so 
I think we should call it a day, Austin. Uh, any other questions? I'm happy to answer them. Uh, you can DM me on Twitter or uh, you can go on our Discord. Uh, we have more people on Discord to help with any questions. Uh, and we'll be organizing office hours as well to help with specific projects that you have and more detailed questions. But this was fun. Yeah, we'll be. And we'll sorry be... again for the delay. Go ahead, Austin. I was going to say, we'll be doing a weekly office hours where we'll be able to dig in a little more depth. We're expecting those to be like an hour, but if we have as many folks showed up like we did today, uh, we're happy to extend that out to make sure we can cover all your questions. If you need immediate assistance, um, go to the Solana Discord, solana.com slash discord, and we have resource channels set up within the hackathon um, section where we have folks ready to help you out all day long. So thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for hanging out. And this will be up on the Solana um, YouTube tomorrow. Awesome. Maybe one, one more thing that I, I just remembered. Uh, I, I will try to like uh, figure out if we can organize a session maybe next week about like oracles. Um, for Like I saw there were some questions about the oracles. So there will be something coming out next week. Cool. Um, so just stay patient. <laughs> yeah, well, um, if you're looking to get a read on all of the upcoming events too, we have an event calendar, a public air table where you can kind of see everything we have scheduled out and then directly on the Solana season website at solana.com slash hackathon, we have um, a rolling list of the weekly events. So we'll get that added up and then keep an eye on the Twitter for everything. Okay, I think that's it. Have a good one, everyone.